Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Linda Grosseff, Program Director for Vision Loss Alliance of New Jersey. And also with us this evening, Elsa Zavoda, Vice President of Programs. Hello, everyone. Hi, Elsa. For those of you who don't know us, we are the voices you hear welcoming everyone into the VLA Zoom room. Thank you for joining us this evening. And just a reminder, this program is being recorded and we ask okay. that you please mute yourself. We'll let everything get nice and quiet and then we will finally begin. Good evening and welcome to Tech Talks hosted by Vision Loss Alliance of New Jersey. Tonight, we're honored to have with us Lucas Frank, Senior Consultant for Special Projects for the Seeing Eye. Before we begin this presentation, I would like to share about Lucas Frank. Lucas is a Certified Orientation and Mobility Specialist and a Guide Dog Mobility Instructor. He graduated from the State University of New York at New Paltz with a BA in Speech Pathology and Audiology. He began working at Seeing Eyes <laughs> Apprentice in 1978. Leaving the seeing eye after eight years, he attended Western, Western Michigan University and earned a master's in orientation and mobility in 1987. He rejoined the seeing eyes staff shortly after completing his degree. In 1993, he became a community instructor, traveling full time across the United States and Canada, working to enhance the working relationships between seeing eye graduates and their dogs. As a result of his experiences in this capacity, he became interested in environmental access for people who are visually impaired. He served as chair of the Environmental Access Committee of Association for Education and Rehabilitation of the Blind and Visually Impaired, AER, and is still active on that committee. He has worked with the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices to create language leading towards a United States standard accessible pedestrian signal and has worked to create and enhance communication and understanding between orientation and mobility specialists, people who are blind or visually impaired, and traffic engineers. Lucas is a past winner of the Orientation and Mobility Division's Sandy Chronic Distinguished Service Award and the American Foundation for the Blind's Access Award. He is proudest, however, of having twice received the Ethel Bender Award from Guide Dog Users Incorporated. Currently, Lucas is the senior consultant for special projects for the seeing eye. He is a former assessor for international for the International Guide Dog Federation and is currently on the development and education committees. He also serves on the board for Vision Loss Alliance of New Jersey. Thank you for that, Lucas. Before we begin, let's review our tech talk format for this evening. We ask that you hold your questions until Lucas cues you. When you ask your questions, please use the raise your hand feature. For those of you who dialed in, the raise your hand feature is star nine. That will raise yeah, your hand. Right star right. six will mute and unmute you, giving you the opportunity to ask your question. If you're on a computer, alt Y to raise your hand. The mute and unmute command is Alt A. At the end of this presentation, Lucas will open up the floor to questions. And at this time, I would like to introduce to you Ms. Frank. Welcome, Lucas. Thank you so much, Linda, and it's, welcome everybody. It's so great. I see some familiar names here, some of them from quite far away, like New Zealand. Bonnie, how wonderful to have you here. It's great. Um, let, me, let me see. Um, I think I'd like to start just discussing how traffic signals work. Um, 
and that's changed a lot. Some, some, some folks here are a little bit older, uh, as am I. I, you know, I grew up in New York City, uh, <clears throat> and in New York City then, and to a great extent still today, all the traffic lights were what are called fixed timed lights. So the light would change literally like clockwork. There were little boxes on the corner. You could sometimes hear them and the, the gears would click and the light would change. And 30 seconds later or whatever, you would hear another click and the light would change back the other way. <clears throat> That's the way it was when I was a kid. And I thought all traffic lights worked that way. And I did, there were occasionally you'd run into a, if you were out of the city, you would run into a push button on a pole. And I never knew what those push buttons did. I kind of thought that if you, there were like plungers and if you pushed them a lot, the a level of fluid would rise in the, in the pole and eventually trigger the light to change at the top. I had no idea what was going on with those things. Then, and I, and I didn't for many years. And then, and then I, I went and became a mobility instructor. And I still was never educated at that time in how traffic lights worked, not really. I did an internship at the Veterans Administration in Palo Alto, California. And there I started to get an apron. Uh, of, of what was going on with the lights, but I still didn't really understand them. Then, as Linda said, I, I became a community instructor and I started to travel around the United States, working with people all over the country. And I, every now and again, I would encounter an intersection where I couldn't figure out how the lights worked. It didn't seem to be like the old model in New York City, where the lights would change every 30 seconds or so. They, there didn't seem to be a pattern. And the other thing that was happening was that I was running into graduates, people who had dogs from, from the seeing eye, and they would report having experiences that were really disconcerting. These were experienced people, people who had learned to travel and been traveling successfully for years. And they would go to cross a street that they had crossed many times before, and they would cut off, be cut off by a car made crossing that had never happened to them before. Or they would have a near miss with traffic that had never happened to them before. And that was startling. Uh, and and I, that happened fairly frequently. And again, the experience of being at an intersection and not understanding how that intersection was working anymore was, was very disconcerting. And then in about 1995 or six, I was in Atlanta and I had that same experience, not once, but three times where I was dealing with a, an intersection that I was trying to help someone figure out how to get across. And on three occasions, I, I, I realized that I, I just didn't understand how this intersection was working. And so I, I, I went back to the drawing board and I said, who's building these things? Who is designing these intersections? You know, in my education, both at the Seeing Eye, at, uh, at Western Michigan University, and in my internship, I had never heard the words traffic and engineer in one sentence. It just had never come up. I had learned a ton uh, in all of those settings about optometry. I knew the difference between a cataract and glaucoma, for example. I knew how to read a, uh, an eye report. I didn't know anything about traffic engineering. I just had no idea. And so I came back to New Jersey and I went to the library over in, in Chester and I started to look up traffic and engineer and design and I suddenly discovered that there were a number of programs that taught traffic engineering. And so I found one at the New Jersey Institute of Technology and I called them up and I said, I wanna to talk to you guys. The guy's name was Kiri Mizanzakis or something like that. And I, I said, I'd like to, to learn about how traffic lights work. 
And he said, well, the guy you want to talk to is the guy who runs all the lights in Newark. He knows a ton. So I said, that's a great idea. So he gave me his name and his name was Baman Izadmir. Never forget it. So I called Baman up and I said, I want to talk to you about how traffic lights work. And he said, sure. And I said, is next week okay? I could stop by. And he said, yeah, no, actually, I'm going to a convention. And I said, oh, what kind of convention are you going to? He said, a traffic engineering convention. And I said, you guys have conventions? There are a lot of you? He said, oh, yeah, there's lots of us. I said, well, where's the convention? He said, Denver. I said, oh. <laughs> so I went to my boss, and my job was to work with people all over the country. And I said, are we having any problems in Denver at the moment? He said, yeah, actually, there's somebody who's applied to the program. And I said, can I go? And he said, OK. And so I wandered into this traffic engineering convention, and I was amazed, just amazed. You know, if you, you look at the conferences, maybe you've been to a, an ACB or an NFB conference, or maybe a local a ACB or NFB conference, and we have nice conferences, I'm not complaining, but these guys have money, we don't. <laughs> and they have really, really nice conferences. And so I sat in on things, didn't understand anything, and I went to, their, to the booth and I bought a book on traffic engineering. And I read it on the plane back. And I was like, oh, now I get it. I had sort of surmised some of the stuff that was going on, but it was, it was way different. Things really began to change actually in the mid to late 70s, just as I was getting into the business. And you know why? Computers. Computers. You know, in Morristown, some of you who know Morristown, Christina, at the end of Phoenix Avenue, where it comes into Washington Place, there used to be, and it's still there, but you can't see it, it's buried underground, a pressure plate. Some of you older folks may remember this, that in the old days, if you had a main drag and you had a little side street coming into it, there would be what was called an actuator plate. And you would drive up to it and there would be this metal bar across the road and underneath that metal bar were two huge springs. And your car would sit on the, would go onto the springs and the springs would go kathunk and that would make the light change. Okay, that was the way it was done then. And so you can imagine if you wanted to, to make an intersection like that, you had to dig a deep hole, you had to get a backhoe, you had to put in all this construction equipment and seal it up again and make it really nice. Um, and so I thought that was the way light still worked. But as I discovered from my traffic engineering book, that was pretty old hat. And it keeps changing every, it's getting more and more high tech. Basically what happens at traffic lights, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint a, a, a picture for you. I'm gonna ask you all to follow along with me, okay? Everybody with me on your market set, we're gonna build an intersection, okay? Let's imagine that there's a major road. Everybody there? Then imagine that a little road comes into it, maybe a development road that comes out of a development onto the big road. Everybody with me? Say you can shake your cameras or whatever. Um, the, um, I see cameras moving, that's good. Um, the Big road, all traffic engineers are all about efficiency. That's what they're about. They, they want that traffic on that big road to move all the time without any interruptions, unless it's absolutely necessary for safety. So instead of having to dig a big trench and put in the springs and the metal plate, what they do now is on the side street, okay, not on the big street, on the side street, they put in, in the old days, even recently, they would put in what's called an induction loop. They would take a saw, cut a slit in the roadway, lay in some wire, and connect it up to a computer. And they would put an electrical current through the wire, and if a car came and sat over that wire, the 
volume of metal in that vehicle would change the flow of the electrons through that wire and the car would be detected by a computer. Okay, we can get back to this and maybe I'll take a break and take a few questions in a few minutes before we get too deep into this. That, <clears throat> that way the intersection would know there was a car there and gradually the light would change. The light would change for typically seven seconds for the side street to either cross or pull out onto the main road for a single car. All right. If there was another car behind it, the light would detect that and add another two seconds. If there was another car behind that, it would add another two seconds to that. So you might have seven plus two plus two for three cars. Then the light would begin to change back. You would get a yellow on the side street, then a red on the side street, then a green on the main road. Okay. So let's imagine there was only a single car there. You would get seven seconds for that first car and then maybe two seconds for the yellow light and then maybe a second for the red light and back the other way. So you might have 11 seconds of total time for that side street traffic to pull out because there was only one car, okay? Now, here's where the problem was coming in. If you were trying to cross the little road, you know, you were in pretty good shape because the light would change and that green would go for a long time because the main road had the green as sort of a default, okay? But if you were trying to cross the main road, let's say it was a four lane road and you thought that it was like the old clocks and clockwork intersections in New York City where it would go 30 seconds one way, 30 seconds the other way, 30 seconds one way. And you knew that you had to cross the street with the beginning of near side parallel flow. Then there you are waiting to cross that main road. The light changes. You think you've got 30 seconds to cross that main road, but actually, because it's been what's called actuated, it now gives you seven seconds plus a few seconds change. So instead of having 30 seconds to get across that main road, you have 10 or 11. And that's what was happening to people that I knew. They were crossing these bigger streets that they had always crossed perfectly fine, but all of a sudden they had come in, laid in some of this wiring, and now it was what the engineers would call snappy, tightly timed. Just get one car out, get that main road back moving again. And the people that I was working with didn't know it. They just had no idea. Um, but what about if people had to cross that road? What about if there were pedestrians who had to cross that road? Did the traffic engineers not give a darn about them. They just said to heck with them. We're gonna give them seven seconds or nothing. They have to run. Oh no, traffic engineers are actually quite nice. A little weird sometimes, but quite nice. Um, so what did they do? Well, they put in push buttons. And what do the push buttons do? The push buttons let the intersection know, the computer that runs the intersection, which is called the controller, the push buttons let the intersection know that there's a pedestrian there. If there's a pedestrian there, then that timing that I just spent some time talking about with the seven plus three plus or seconds or 11 seconds to get across that street no longer applies because you push the button. When you push the button, you let the intersection know that it has to overlay a pedestrian timing. And what is that pedestrian timing? Well, what they do is they calculate how fast people walk. And <clears throat> years ago, they calculated it at four feet per second. Now they've dropped it down to 3.5 because we're all getting older. So we're not moving quite as quick, but uh, the four is easy to multiply by. So <clears throat> let's say you were waiting to cross the street and you pu did push the button this time because you knew the button was there. 
Well, assuming that it's an intersection that's designed for pedestrians, you would get a visual pedestrian walk sign. And that typically pedestrian walk sign would say walk for seven seconds. Okay. Well, that's not, we just said that's not enough time to cross the street. Ah, but here's one way to think about this. I want you to think about this timing as having an appetizer, a main course, and a dessert. Okay. That seven seconds is regulated by a book called the MUTCD. You can have it as low as four, but it's typically seven seconds of walk. Visually, there's a walking guy. You may have seen that or may remember it. Uh, maybe you, you used to be able to see it, now you can't. Uh, there's a, a walking guy and he'll typically stay on for seven seconds. Then it goes into the main course. What's the main course? The main course is the width of the street divided by, let's make it easy, four feet per second. So you've got seven seconds of walk if we've got four 10 foot lanes, we've got 40 feet, okay, of, of roadway to cross, all right? So what you would get is you would get 10 seconds of flashing don't walk, all right? So 10 foot lanes, four feet per second. Uh, so you would get for 10 feet, which is 40 feet, you would get 10 seconds of flashing don't walk. And then you would have another three seconds or four seconds for it to go to yellow, red, and then green the other way. So instead of having seven seconds plus three to cross the street, you have seven seconds of walk plus 10 seconds of flashing don't walk plus three or four seconds. So you go from having, let's say, 10 seconds to having, let's say, 20, almost double. And the wider the street, the more time that flashing don't walk goes to calculate out how much time people have to cross the street. I hope I'm making some sense here. So if you don't push the button and you only have one car there, you're only going to get seven seconds of, of, of green time for that car. You won't get any visual walk indication and then the light's gonna change back. If you do push the button when the light changes and it won't change right away, when the light changes, you get seven seconds of walk, 10 seconds of flashing, don't walk, and, um, uh, and then a few seconds of change, so you get up to 20. So pushing the button made a difference. We have a problem. How do you know there's a button? If you're blind, how do you find the button? Huge problem. Another problem, let's imagine you have, you, you have two streets and you get a signal. How do you know which street that signal is for? Is it for street A or street B? Main street, side street. Well, in the United States, back in the 70s and early 80s, some traffic engineers went to Japan and the Japanese are wonderful people and they have a tremendous aesthetic sense. And they thought that it would sound nice to have bird calls to indicate which street had the light. So they would have, they had two sounds. They had a cuckoo and they had a chirp. You've heard those I expect somewhere. So if you were, and they were, there was a convention that they figured out that if you were crossing the north south street the sound would be the cuckoo because the o's in cuckoo go with the o in north and if you're going east west you would get the chirp or cheep for the east and west sound and that worked terrifically well unless you were going northwest or southeast and then you had to make a choice or if you lived in salt lake city where no one read the manual when they installed them and they put them in backwards so that they had cuckoo for east-west and chirp for now north-south until somebody told the traffic engineers in Salt Lake City, hey, you put them in backwards. And they went, oh my gosh, they actually read the manual. Nobody reads manuals. And they said, we'll change them back. And all the blind people in Salt Lake City said, no, don't do that, we'll all die. So th that was a little bit of a problem. So the Australians did something very different. 
What they did was they only had one sound. They had a, a rapid tick. I'm going to tap my, my, my computer, see if it makes a sound. You hear that? Maybe not. Something like that, just a, like a, almost like a, a woodpecker. And what the way they differentiated from which street was which was where they put the push buttons and that where the sound came from. The old cuckoo chirp type systems, they had speakers up above and it broadcast it to the entire intersection. The newer Australian systems, and I'm sure that Bonnie is very used to them now uh, in, in New Zealand, would have the signal quite close to you. If you were crossing the street, uh, the major street and the parallel street was on your left, this, that little pedestrian push button would be on your right. And if you were crossing the street with the main street on your right, the pedestrian push button would be on your left. If the speaker sound came from your left, it was for the small street. If you were crossing, the, if it was coming from somewhere else, it wasn't for you. So they did it instead of using a symbolic thing like cuckoo for north, south, or chirp for east west, they put the speaker for each intended crossing right next to the departure point. And that's how you knew what street it was for. Well, it was a better idea, but the United States didn't have any standards for this stuff. There just weren't any. So what that meant, California had the cuckoo chirp standard, but nobody else had any standards. So what that meant was that if a local blind person was having trouble getting across the street, they would go, they would figure out they had to go talk to a traffic engineer and go talk to a traffic engineer. Traffic engineers come in two flavors. One flavor is <clears throat> that if you ask them to do something, they would go to the manuals and say, there's no regulation concerning this, so we can't do anything. The other flavor of traffic engineer would go to the, the same manuals and look it up and say, there's no regulation concerning this. We can do whatever we want. And they would try to, to experiment with a local bell or a horn or something they had in the cabinet. And it worked to get someone across the street, but there was no US standard. And at the same time, this type of intersection design was proliferating all over the place and going further now you have ultra quiet cars, including electric cars that make it even that much harder to figure out some, in some situations, and it's gonna get worse, which, which street it is that you need to cross. So it became imperative to have a United States standard for accessible pedestrian signals so that whether you were traveling in, in St. Louis or Tallahassee or New Jersey, you could use the lights the same way. You know car sighted drivers and some of you were sighted uh, or were able to drive not too long ago you know you never you didn't need to know whether you were going north south east or west you knew you had a green light or a red light and that was it you know so the symbolic symbols like that can work you don't need to <clears throat> you didn't have to memorize one one thing for direct one direction and one for another so it became imperative to design a, a system in the united states and we we over the course of the last 25 years have had uh, a design designs for accessible pedestrian signals that very much follow the Australian model. Uh, the one drawback of that is, uh, is that they're dependent on good location of pedestrian push buttons and figuring out how to get traffic engineers to understand that is not easy. Uh, and that's been, been, been quite the fight, uh, but we're getting there. So the bottom line now is that when you get to a corner, if you hear a, a, what's called a locator tone, it sounds like a grandfather clock, tick, tick, tick once per second. That's an indication that it's an accessible pedestrian signal. If you find that push button and press it, <clears throat> you, there are two levels of press. One, on many of them, if you press it, it will say wait. Okay, uh, if you press it again, it will say wait. If you hold the button down for a second, and you may get an information message that says something like, wait us Broadway at Grant. Now you know that you're, you're Broadway. 
not grand, across Broadway at grand. Then all that you put in by pushing the button, letting the computer know there. And when the pedestrian in, timing is, is applied, you... Lucas, I think you he, he, you broke up. Yeah, he's uh, we lost you. We did. He'll be back. <laughs> he probably realized that he um, wasn't getting a good connection. Yeah, um, um so, yeah. So I I couldn't hear the last minute either. I just needed to tell you all. Sorry to interrupt, but that was such a good speech. And he's, he's back on. Yeah. I did Wonderful. That was such good information. Okay, I'm glad he's back. Stay he's tuned, doing... Ashley. He's back. I don't know he's where doing I went. A great job. I think I was uh, attacked You're by a traffic in engineer. The world of Zoom. Yeah, with I'm the back. Gremlins. Awesome. So, uh, in terms of the regulation about <clears throat> what the sound should be, so there was a lot of discussion about this, and what was decided is that the sound to cross the, the and there are exceptions to this, and I'll get into them that if you're going to cross the street, the device immediately next to you, so if you're crossing the street with the parallel street on your left, it would be to your right, okay? If you're crossing the street with the parallel street on your right, it would be to your left, away, because we wanted to put the, the push buttons away from the intersection a little bit so people weren't misled into wandering into the street. <laughs> so they, when, when it comes time to, uh, to cross the street when the visual walk indication comes on when it said that says the, the little walking guy what you'll get from the speaker immediately next to you would be what's called a rapid tick you know the locator tone i said sounded like a grandfather clock the walk indication sounds like a really angry metal woodpecker okay <laughs> it's a, a, a rapid tick um, and that will only go on for seven seconds. It will only go on for the appetizer. It will only go on for the equivalent of the visual walk indication. Then it will go back to the locator tone, the grandfather clock. And it will give you the, that grandfather clock until the time expires. So remember we had our 40 foot wide street. We had, so it would go on for that, that 10 seconds. Of, of crossing time. Um, so the, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that you will get a speech message, which will say, grand, walk sign is on to cross grand. Grand, walk sign is on, and it will sometimes stop right in the middle because it will stop as exactly the moment that walk indication goes off. So it might say, Grand, walk sign is on to cross grand. Grand, walk sign is up. And that means that the visual walk indication has turned off. Then it will go into the tick, which will go on for what's called the pedestrian clearance interval, the time to get across that street, and, and you're done. So all, the only indication that you get from that device is you get that speech message. Well, you might say, well, why isn't the speech message everywhere? Wouldn't it be better to have speech everywhere rather than that symbolic indication? Don't think so, and I'll tell you why. If you've ever had a conversation in a really noisy place, you know you're sometimes going, what? What did you say? And it's because you can't quite hear, and there's nothing noisier than a busy street corner. So uh, our feeling was, and I helped write this stuff, and some research supported it, that you're better off with a symbolic indication that, you know, angry metal woodpecker than, than with speech. Unless, and there are situations like this, for any one of a number of reasons, there are two of those devices on one pole. Then you can't tell when it goes into the angry woodpecker which one is going off, okay? There you have to use speech. The other thing is, is that a lot of us, and I include myself uh, at, at my age, have a little bit of hearing loss, all right? When you have hearing loss, you can't hear consonants well. And if you add noise to that, 
figuring out whether you're trying to cross Washington Place or Washington Street might lead to problems. So we feel that in most situations, a symbolic uh, inf piece of information is better. Another thing that, that has happened is that um, there are now a lot in a lot of places that are what are called visual countdown signals, where it, the, after the walk indication, the walking guy goes off, you start seeing a visual countdown that goes 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. And so a lot of people who are blind or visually impaired feel that that should be a, an equivalent that's offered to them. And in principle, I agree. In practice, I think it's a problem. And the problem is that people get distracted by what they hear. And while the, an audible countdown signal gives you information, a quiet car can hurt you. So we're better, you know, so the distraction of, of being paying attention, like I've got 10 seconds, I've got nine seconds, boom. You know, then you're, then there's the, the car is. So we're, it's, a, it's a point of, of argument and discussion, but the regulation says, the regulations say you don't, you, the only thing you need to do is put in the walk information. A lot of places do put in the countdowns and the other, the, you know, the audible countdowns, which are, is available, but it's a lot of sound in the street for a very long time. And especially if you've got any other people who live around there, they might get really annoyed. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, there's a lot of questions and a lot of answers here that I want to leave, leave room for. I would just like to add two pieces of information to this now about intersections in general. And New Jersey uh, is, is a little different from other places. Each state has their own sort of traffic engineering culture. Uh, there are, but the, the basics are regulated through a book called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which I recommend to you if you have any problem with insomnia at all. Uh, but the, um, the manual uh, governs certain elements of this, but for example, in, in New Jersey, it's very rare to run into a true, what are called roundabouts, okay? But in other parts of the country, roundabouts are incredibly popular. And I think it's quite likely that over the course of the next decade, uh, roundabouts are gonna become much more popular in New Jersey. Um, the other element of what's going on in the street is of course the electric and very quiet cars. Um, and all of these things I think conspire to make crossing the crossing task more difficult. And we need some, and again, I think uh, accessible pedestrian signals uh, or APSs as we call them, uh, are something of an equalizer here. Um, roundabouts are actually very safe for pedestrians, but they're intimidating. And uh, there's a lot to know about that as well. So I just wanna raise those issues in a, in a really broad context. And now I think, oh, and who, there's Cindy Flerman. Cindy, how wonderful to see you here. Um, that uh, uh, I, I think I'll open it up for questions if, if you think it's the right time. With a, there's a lot of, I, I gave a lot of information. Sure, now. that's a lot of information. <clears throat> okay, we're opening up for questions. So please use the raise your hand feature and I will Tracy, you have a question. You can unmute yourself, Tracy. Thank you. Me, the first, I can't believe it. Hi, Lucas. Thank you. Although it always makes me afraid to go out, but. Uh, yeah, I you know it, it is scary, but you know, ignorance in this case is not bliss. No, no, it isn't. But I want to ask about, about turning cars. My husband was telling me how he, he uses a cane. He was telling me how he was crossing the street. He had the light, there was a break in the traffic and somebody decided she was going to go zooming through even though he was in the middle of the crosswalk and she did not see him. And I had heard recently she was turning left. And I had heard recently that, that SUVs have like blind spots built into them. So it's even harder for them to see a pedestrian. So yeah. I wondered what you had to say about that. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Uh, the, 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 the phenomenon you're talking about is, I think it's hard to say in this particular case, who the hell knows, you know, but the, the phenomenon you're talking about is often caused by what's called the A pillar. Okay, so not pillow, pillar. Okay, so if you're sitting in a car, if you get behind the driver's seat of a car, Tracy, don't turn it on, please. The, uh, the 
just ahead and to your left at about 11 o'clock, there's the roof support pillar for the car. Does that make sense? Yep. If you're sitting in the passenger seat, it would be just ahead of you at about one o'clock on the right. It's, it's a, you've got the glass of the windshield, then you've got the glass of the side view, and, uh, the, the door mirror, the door window, but then you have a, a large piece of steel that supports the roof. Does that make sense? Yep. That is on cars, those two pillars are called the A pillar or A pillars. And uh, the, the middle pillar that hold, between the front door and the back door is the B and the back ones are C pillars. So, um, and then there's caterpillars, but that's an entirely different. <laughs> but the, um, so the, as cars have become safer and safer for, for passengers, those pillars have gotten bigger because they now contain airbags. So that when there's an accident, that pillar will blow out and you'll have a nice airbag there to save you, okay? And they've become structurally more sound as well. The problem is that it blocks a segment of the driver's view. And I've had the experience as a driver where and I've, I've almost been hit in that situation also but by, by a driver. But as a driver, I've had situations where someone all of a sudden just pops out. It's like, crap, where did he come from? I never saw him. He was being hidden by the A-pillar. In other words, if I hold my hand out at arm's length, okay, I can see a lot around that. You know, but if I hold my hand closer to my face, I block out a lot of a, a large segment of my view. Does that kind of make sense? And so the A pillar issue is, is significant. I know a woman who was hit by a car not too long ago, uh, and and she happened to be hit by a Verizon truck, but she was not not injured at all. The guy saw her at the last second, and that's what happens. Boom. And you put on the because people pop out, they disappear. Be, what happens is if you start driving and your A pillar is blocking a bit of your view, and a person haps, happens to be behind that A pillar from where you're driving, and you start to make a left, they start to go and you start to make a left turn. That A pillar can track that person as you're making that turn, and then all of a sudden they pop out. So, you know, the, the, what, what your husband had experience, experience there was, is, 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 is called an A-pillar incident. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on around this. I recently saw an invention that was made. Uh, I, I don't know idea if it will catch on. I, I kind of doubt it. It's probably expensive. Where they put a little camera, a tiny little camera, inside the outside of the A-pillar. And in effect, it sort of projects on the A-pillar on the inside and becomes transparent. So it's kind of a cool idea. I, I don't know that it will ever catch on, but it is a, it is a risk with left-turning cars. We tend to think of right turns as, as a threat. It's, you, ha you have to bend your mind around the idea that left turns can be a threat as well. Is there anything a blind person could do to like uh, hopefully avoid this problem or do you just have you to- You know, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what, I, I, I don't know, but here's something I've been thinking about a lot. Of course, most of the people that I work with are- our guide dog users. Um, and I'll tell you something, in, in Holland, I, live, I grew up in Holland, uh, and in Holland, um, the culture is that when blind people are cr crossing the street, they hold their cane, and especially for guide dog users, but for other people as well. Uh, you can go online and look up uh, street crossing in Holland for blind people, whatever. It's Witte Stok in Dutch. The cane is held roughly at shoulder height and extended straight ahead. Okay. And one of the things that does is it scares the hell out of bicyclists. <laughs> uh, another thing that it does, though, is it gives you a wider profile. You're longer from front to back because that cane is out. A lot of times when the way we use a cane, and I'm not criticizing the way we use a cane, it's low. You know, if you, as you're saying, with an SUV, you may, you may miss that, but maybe something longer would help. I'm actually of the opinion that in the next decade or two, uh, American guide dog users will start carrying canes for any one of a number of reasons, but partly because of that. They don't in the United States now, it's fallen away, but in much of the rest of the world, people do carry canes and, with their dogs.
Thank you. Sure. Uh, Christina, you are next up. Dr. Brino, I presume. Look, it's very, very informative. I had no idea about the timing. And um, my intersection, I love it because we have, you know, the one on Jackson Ave where it yep. actually counts down. But the ones in Morristown, they're hard to hear. Uh -huh. Well, vol volume is volume or sound intensity is an issue. Um, and the personally, I would rather see them quieter rather than louder. Why? Because you're going to get an awful lot of pushback. If you make them so easy to hear, I, there's one in, in uh, DeKalb, Illinois, that I think you can hear in Indiana, but <laughs> the, it's just amazing. So I, 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 if they're well designed, they should, should be very close to the departure point and they can be relatively quiet. Just as you know, it's it's the difference between having earbuds and uh, and, and a boombox. If you put the if the devices are placed too far away from yeah. the crosswalk, then they have to be loud to allow people to find it. And you know, then you start to get stuff. You know, New York City. I, I used to, and New York City's in for a big change in the next a uh, couple of years because they just law the city just lost a lawsuit and they have to put in a lot of accessible pedestrian signals, but you know, in New York City, you've got a problem because you have you would need eight devices per intersection at 20 blocks to a mile. And I'm concerned wow. about that. You start talking about a lot of sound in that situation. You're going you to hear start, it all over the place. You don't even know what's going to be going on. Number one. And uh, downtown Oakland, California was like that. There was a division street. They had the old cuckoo chirp. And there's a division street that runs right down the middle of Oakland. So it splits. So one half of the town is on one cycle and the other half of the town is on the other. So every 30 seconds, the entire town would either go cuckoo or chirp. It was nuts okay. so, and loud with overhead speakers. So, you know, this is, you know, the, we have to be aware that we're part of a community. And especially, for example, in New York, where everything is vertical and above intersections, you start making too much noise there or in any kind of residential sensitivity. And you, eventually you may win in the short term, but you lose in the long because of mm -hmm. vandalism. People start jamming stuff in the speakers. It's an issue. So I, you know, I, I, I mean, I would ideally, well, there's other stuff going on too. Things are moving to apps now. There are devices, uh, Polara, which may, is one of the bigger uh, APS manufacturers in the country, is moving towards an, uh, an iPhone app that may help you trigger a device and give you information as well. So, all, you know, this is all a moving target. There's a what lot. What is the roundabout? Is that like, a, where the, it's like a circle? It's like a Ferris wheel turned sideways. No, just kidding. The uh, <laughs> what what a roundabout is in New Jersey. We have a history of uh, traffic circles, large traffic circles. It used years ago. It used to be the Ledgewood Circle, uh, the Flemington Circle, uh, the Netconk Circle. There are a bunch of them. Um, that design is uh, has been discredited and has gone away. But roundabouts are much smaller. That's one of the things that differentiates them. The other thing that differentiates them is that uh, on the old New Jersey style traffic circles, or in, in Massachusetts, they're called rotaries, uh, traffic on the circle that was moving around the circle had to yield on to traffic that was coming onto the circle, which was a disaster. Um, at roundabouts, traffic coming onto the circle has to yield to the traffic on the circle. There's different rules. The good thing about roundabouts is they're very tight. You know, can you imagine if you were walking around, you were walking really fast around a basketball, okay? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it turned into a baseball. You would have to slow down to stay close to the baseball or whether you go sailing off into space. Roundabouts are tight. They're designed to slow cars down through geometry. And uh, they're pretty effective at that. The problem is, is that there's no phasing. You don't have street A going, then street B going, and street A going. So it's tricky to judge. Uh, there are lots of advantages to roundabouts, but there are also problems. There are things you can do to make them safer. Uh, and, and there's a lot of work that was done by, uh, a, 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 I don't know what to call this. It's an NCHRP panel, which is, NCHRP is the National Cooperative Highway Research Project. And uh, the 
and they they do research on stuff and there was research on how to make roundabouts more accessible to people who are blind and visually impaired and they came up with a series of recommendations including using raised crosswalks that uh -huh. sort of force cars to yield uh -huh. stuff like that so by passively by making them slow down so they go don't go over the bumps too fast you know so there's things you can do but it, you know you, the best bet if you know of a roundabout going in is to get in on the ground floor and start talking to people we got but you'll be happy to know christina that yeah. the next dog you get yes was trained with roundabout with, you'll be dealing with a roundabout at the corner of spring and morris oh okay <laughs> Sounded, <to> it. <laughs> and the cane the cane it is is a mate like i want another little cane again because that really works with holding it up and letting people know when you're crossing that's why we did that didn't we yeah yes we did and i love it i want another little cane so find me one please we'll thank you okay um, we have see. we have yeah. a number of questions so i just want to let everybody know i i will get to all of your hand raising so Lucas can answer your questions. If you have a phone number, know that I'm gonna call the last four digits of your phone number. So next up, we have 7696. The last four digits, 7696. <clears throat> Hi there, it's Trisha. How's everybody doing? Oh, hello, Trisha. Hey, oh, I yeah. think this is an excellent topic, Lucas. Ladies, thank you so much for having Lucas talk about this. And it's really, really interesting. So I live in Sea Caucus, and my question is, how does one go about to start the process within the town to get the audible signals implemented within the town? I already started the conversation with my mayor and he's looking into it. And the last I heard, he says it's very complicated. From what I understand, it's not even within the town. It's more than that. So where would we, you know, go next, Lucas, to, to do this? Uh -huh. The best bet if you live in Secaucus is to move. Uh, no, just kidding. Move. <laughs> yeah. uh, Thank the, you. Um, that's right. No, the... Um, the, tr the trick is to figure out who controls the intersection. And that's not always straightforward. So you may live in a town, but it has a county road or even a state road running through it. So the, the first thing you need to figure out is, is, is it a state controlled intersection, county or, or, or town? Right. Then you need to figure out who the traffic engineer is who control who's in charge of that intersection. And if it's state, there's somebody in the region. If it's a county, it depends a lot. Counties typically have traffic engineers. Towns often don't have specific traffic engineers. They have civil engineers who are also responsible for for traffic. Then you have to write them a letter. You can't call them because there's no track of it. And so there's no accountability. Um, I have a, 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 uh, a sample letter that, you know, if you can write me and, and uh, my, I think we can make my email address available, it's lfrank at seeingeye.org. Uh, just bear in mind that Frank is F-R-A-N-C-K. So lfrank at seeingeye.org. Uh, I can make available to you a... Uh, for a letter which has certain trigger language in it. So basically what the trigger language says is this. At dear, dear traffic engineer, um, thank you for putting that in the uh, uh, chat. Um, the, uh, it says, dear, dear engineer, my name is so-and-so, I'm blind or visually impaired at intersection X with street Y, there are visual walk signals. And that's kind of a request, uh, a requirement. If there is a traffic light there, are there visual walk signals for, for people? If there are, then you can claim that your rights are being denied because you are being denied access to information that is being provided by the government to sighted people. And that's the wow. Argument. Okay. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. So it's an ADA violation. Okay. And uh yeah. 
so but so the 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 homework is figure out who you're dealing with and then different counties different towns are uh more or less responsive and one of the things you need to do is when you send one of these letters you need to send it certified mail you don't want to do it by email you know got it okay you know because there has to be a paper trail and they can't they can't circular file those quite so readily wow so you, right. so you start out very polite and so on and so forth. And then you move your way up the ladder and it could be a long, hard fight, but yeah. That's I bet. You. I bet it could take a long time. Yeah, I would. Yeah, definitely. I'll email you and love to get a copy of that letter and take care of it and find out who the traffic engineer is, the civil engineer and find out about the roads. I, I appreciate yeah, just, it. Thank you. Sure. You know, I, I can help you a little bit with that, Christina, or uh, rather uh, Trish. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, Trisha. All right, next up we have Anne Marie. Hello. Hi. 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 How are you guys? Good. Well, good. Doing well. Oh. Thanks, Anne Marie. Through Trish. I wanted to know if we email us and also about how to go about making a request for an audible traffic signal. But I have one other, and you may or not be able to answer, may or may not be able to answer this. Mm -hmm. I live in Pittman. We have all downtown area, mm -hmm. and right in the middle of our main street is a theater. And at the theater, there is a crosswalk. Mm -hmm. Out of the street, there is a signal, maybe not quite shoulder level but there is not what I'm is sorry, you're, you're breaking up a little bit i'm having a little trouble hearing you maybe it's me i'm not sure change rooms if that helps is that any better we'll find out go ahead so in my downtown area it's a block long it's the main mm -hmm. the main thoroughfare through Pittman. there's right. a theater in front of the theater is a crosswalk there is not a traffic light there but there is a signal on either side of the street, just below shoulder level. What is that signal for? So, so let me see if I understood that. So there's no traffic light there. Is there a crosswalk, do you know? There is a crosswalk. Okay. Uh, and there's something there with a push button that you can press? Yes. Okay. That's probably what's called an RRFB. F is in Frank. Okay. And RRFB stands, I'm, I can't swear to this. So don't, you know, I, I can't, obviously I don't know the intersection or the situation exactly, but it sounds to me like it's an RRFB. RRFBs stand for rectangular rapid flashing beacon. Okay. RRFB, rectangular rapid flashing beacon. And probably what there is there, it's a mid-block crosswalk and it's by a theater so that occasionally there's pretty high volumes of people going across that street. Does that sound true to form? Yes. Yeah. So what they do is they put in a pedestrian crosswalk and there's a pole there and there's a push button on that pole. That's true so far, right? Yes. When you push that button, lights on the crossing start to flash. So uh, on, the, on the pedestrian indication, it goes flash, 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 okay? Now, those lights are yellow. Yellow lights do not mean stop to drivers. And if you go through a flashing yellow light, you don't get a ticket. So it's not like at a traffic light where it goes red, yellow, green, yellow, red, right? It just yeah. flashes. So you can have them made accessible. What they could do is they could put in an accessible push button there, which would have a locator tone, like we talked about, the grandfather clock tick with me? Yeah. Okay. But when you push the button, it would not say walk sign is on, because there's no walk sign and there's no red light. Does that make sense? This makes sense. My question is, if that's what's going on, because I can't see well enough, I have some sight, but I can't see well no. enough. 
day or night to see the flashing light. I just am aware that that is there because it's a crosswalk. How do they see a flashing light during the day if it's a pedestrian crossing? Uh, great question. Well, it, you know, th that device, that particular device is really bright and, and it catches people's attention. There's been a fair amount of research on that uh, and it will work on the day. But what you can't do, so you could have that made accessible, but what it would do is that we would have a locator tone when you push the button. It, it varies a bit state by state, I think, but it would say yellow lights are flashing. It would not say walk sign is on. And you've got to be bloody careful at those because right. there, there is there is, you know, cars do stop. They're respectful. Most people are sane and nice, but unfortunately, not all of them are. And no, so I, the information, Lucas, my biggest question truly was, mm -hmm. is it a, is it? a signal to, to passing cars. Like what exactly right. it, I didn't have a clue. Yeah. So, and I, you know, again, I don't really know if I'm talking, I could be talking through my hat, you know, I've never, I don't know what we're talking about here. So like, take everything I say with a large shaker of salt. <laughs> that is like, so, cause I've not, even my mobility instructor, she wasn't sure what it was. Yeah, you have to find out. So if there's a push button, it's probably an RRFB. Was it fairly recently installed? Do you know? For about 18 months. Yeah, it's probably an RRFB because the, the for a long time, the, they were not in the federal manuals and nobody could touch them, but now they are and you can. So that's my guess. And okay. I happened to just look this up this morning, so I know what it says. <laughs> yeah. On to the next question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good luck. Thank Let you. me know. Yeah. Okay, next up we have uh, 0544. You can unmute yourself to ask your question. Hi, it's Ginger. Luke, it's hey, great hey. presentation so far. I have a weird question. I think it's- weird. I would expect nothing less from you, Ginger. Go ahead. <laughs> so when you're standing at the on the edge of the street, if you're actually, you know, past a little bit past the bumps and right yep. on the edge of the street, yep. if you put your cane out, the way that you said, can a car hit that if it's going by and not stopping? Um, well, you know, the, there's so many variables there. Uh, it is a little hard to say, you know, the, uh, I would, it, the intent would be to, to, to bring that cane out just as you were beginning to cross, right? So a lot of times mobility instructors teach and, and that you should flag a cane, right? Drop it down, bounce it a few times so that you're getting movement out of it so that drivers spot it, that, they, that your intent is, is to cross. Um, but I would say generally you can get that out far enough. You know, it's, it, a lot of times you're not using a full length you know, chin height or nose height or top of head height cane. You're using something that's that's almost a child's cane, a little bit shorter. Most dog guide canes are short, relatively short, but they're visible. Okay. Oh, so so could we get a children's like an identifier cane with that? Does that? Yeah, I I, I have seen some. Um, the oh, what, what's his name? Um, it will come to me. Charlie makes a really nice short cane that I like quite a bit. I've always been working on trying to figure out ways to get it attached to the harness well. But uh, yeah, there, yeah, there are there are some canes that that would meet the spec. I don't think they're they're not quite as as durable and so on and so forth, but they're lightweight and they could work. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Good to talk to you as ever. Okay, thank you, Ginger. Uh, we have three, five, four, five. Oh, you can unmute nice yourself to ask your question. Yeah, hi, Lucas. It's Dennis Farrow. How are you? Hey, Dennis, it's been a long time. How are you? It sure has, I know. Yeah. So I have a question about something. Um, this may sound a little silly, but we have apps that operate as GPS um, apps, and then we have apps that do color identification. Have you ever heard of an app that's been developed where the phone could be lifted up to identify what the color of the light is as we are crossing the street? I've never heard of anything like that. I've often wondered why something like that hasn't been or couldn't be developed. 
I have heard of something like that, and actually quite recently. Um, okay. And, uh, I, I can't think of the name of it. I might be able to dig it out somewhere. It was an email that I saw. Uh, and a, a fellow, uh, a mobility instructor in New York City tried it. It was a little bit more success. It depends a lot on how wide the street is, of course. It was mm -hmm. a little bit more successful at night. It was not good at all during the day, and it, mm -hmm. the 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 fall. It didn't give a lot of false positives, I think, but a lot of times it was just frustratingly difficult to do. Now, as as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the uh, <clears throat> um, there the the new Polara is the name of the company that makes this particular APS. They are developing, and I think they've begun to market uh, a device that actually will in effect, take the information using Bluetooth, connect it into the APS, the newest version of the APS. Okay, so in other words, if you have an APS that was installed a year ago, it won't work. If you have an APS that's installed next year, it might very well, all right? Just uh, model changes and so on and so forth. But that when you, when, if you hold the APS, you know, you can press a button and put in a call. So in effect, press the button. And then you, when the walk information comes on, it will say, give you the information from your phone. Uh, the problem with stuff like that is that it may be the, the best thing since sliced bread, but it, you know, it, you, maybe you have to afford the newest phone too. So you, you put mm -hmm. a burden on the population uh, to comply. So there will always, you know, they can't make that the universal standard because not yeah. everybody's going to be able to get one. And what if yeah. your batteries die? And, and, you know, all kinds of things that can go wrong with that stuff. But it is, it is coming that way. Okay, thanks. Yeah. The, the photographic stuff has, not, has just not yet been successful in terms of recognizing that stuff across streets. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, next up, You're we welcome. have Ashley. Is that me, Ashley? That is you, Ashley. Go ahead and yeah. ask your question. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, great. I'm glad you all can hear me, so I guess I found the right buttons on this. Um, so, yeah. yeah, hi, Lucas. Um, thank you for coming. Um, very informative. Okay, so um, I have... Um, I have a, um, a little vision and like, like my central vision only and use a cane, just mm -hmm. as background. So yeah, um, um, two things is I, yes, I agree that um, it's important to pu push those pedestrian buttons because they give you, you know, more time and tell the traffic people that you want to cross the street. But like, um, my question is like, once you push the buttons, um, is it is there like a standard amount of time to um to to have to let the pedestrian cross because like um, most most of the intersections I've encountered don't have those countdown um, audible um, features like saying you have nine seconds eight seconds etc left to cross and my other question was um um. It says, given this is a technology presentation, is there any um, talk about or development in regard to using something like the Sunu band, um, you know, that vibrates in, to work in conjunction with intersections? So it, for example, might vibrate more if you if you're closer to the curb of the street something like that for information if hopefully that question makes sense so those are my two questions all right um let me do the first one first or try Thank you. right so uh, traffic lights or traffic signals as engineers call them operate on cycles all right so Let's uh, sometimes, uh, <clears throat> and th those cycles can vary in length for any one of a number of reasons, and they can be changed. So in other words, you can have longer cycle lengths in rush hour than you do at other times of the day, for example, to allow more, again, what are traffic engineers about? Efficiency and moving cars, okay? That's what they're all about. So let's say you get to a corner and the cycle is halfway through, and you press the button, then the light is gonna change in your favor relatively quickly. 
But let's say that the cycle just started brand new and you push the button, then it's going to have to go all the way through the cycle until it gets to the point where the light will change in your favor. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, very, I think I get it. So it's based very, on the amount. Okay. Yeah. So let's imagine you have a really, really big intersection, eight lanes, okay? <clears throat> and you have the cross street is also pretty big, okay? Yeah. It's going, the and there's a lot of traffic on both streets. Remember we talked about how that intersection is responsive to cars, right? Right. So... <laughs> Um, so it's going to allow a lot of time for the traffic on the main street, but it, there's, it's finite. There's a time when it will end. Then it's going to delegate time to the side street, okay? And if there's a lot of traffic on that side street, there'll be a lot of time there too, okay? Now, at some intersections, they can actually do what's called, and you may have noticed this, that there's sometimes what's called split phasing, okay? Yes. At a split phased intersection, you would have, let's say you the, the big street is north-south. Everybody, you with me? Uh-huh. And the small street, which is only relatively small, it's still a pretty big street, is east-west, right? Right. Okay. And let's say that you're heading, um, let's say west. And what can happen is they can let all the eastbound traffic through first, and then they can let the westbound traffic go. So it's not east and west starting at the same time. They split it. Does that make sense? Oh, so, so that's what split phase means. Yeah, I think I get it. One at a time. Ah, I know what right. that meant. Yeah. Seeing light bulbs popping all over the place. So yeah. So... Oh. Yeah, so that's what split phase means. Instead of having the east and west going at the same time, they split it. So they have now, so let's say you're waiting to go westbound and westbound is the second of those two splits, right? And you push the button right when the north-south traffic started. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. Well, guess what? That whole huge north-south flow is gonna have to be completed. And then the east flow is going to have to be completed. And then they're going to apply a pedestrian timing and that little walking guy and all that stuff we talked about to the westbound stuff. They're not going to interrupt everything, okay, and say, everybody stop, Ashley's coming, hang out. We're going to, you know, they wait until it's your time in the cycle when it's your phase that's appropriate for you. And then they will overlay a pedestrian timing on top of the uh, the vehicular timing. But in fact, because there's so much traffic on that westbound street, it probably won't affect your timing very much, but you would get the visual walk indication. And if there were an APS there, you would get a notification that it was your turn. Mm, I see. So there's, okay. So it's dependent on a lot of the intersections and the traffic and variable other variables. So it doesn't sound like there's much of a time standard there's not it's not like when you push the button the light will change within 10 or 15 seconds of that's what i was wondering that was my question yeah yeah, yeah. I, it, it doesn't work that way it's, it's it, time when the time. yep that's exactly correct okay oh yikes okay well oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah that's you. the way that works thanks ashley michelle you're up next Okay, yes, thank you. Hi, Lucas. Hey, Michelle. Um, thank you, and I, I appreciate your humor. You've made me chuckle quite a few times. Thank you. Um, a question, I live in a small town. I'm in New Milford in, in Bergen County, New Jersey, and oh, I, have two, I have two intersections that I cross regularly. I am partially sighted, and I use a cane. Yep. And my question to you is what you suggest to people or how you teach people when there is no delay and there is no auditory signal. There are buttons and I continue to press them, but like I said, there's no delay. And I-, I When you in say fact, no yeah, delay, I'm not sure yeah. what you- So when you described, um, a t I forget what you called it, time for the, the pedestrian to cross, yeah. um, there's no time built into this pattern 
for the pedestrian to cross. So what I what I do as soon as the one as soon as let's say north south stops, mm -hmm. east west begins. So I use the surge and I use my cane. Right. And but I'm wondering how you know when you when you instruct people on how to cross intersections where there is no pedestrian time allowed okay wait. Uh, what are the me, yeah what are the tips me, that you give okay let, let me let me scroll this back a little bit mm -hmm. okay. none of the in, there there is something that is called an exclusive pedestrian phase okay and that is when everything stops to allow the pedestrians to go and mm -hmm. I think you're thinking that that's what I'm talking about, and I'm not. Okay. When they overlay, a, when they put a pedestrian timing on, it's not the same as saying it's a dedicated pedestrian phase. The traffic is still moving. You can be cut mm -hmm. off by right turners. You can be yeah. cut off by left turners, but it is a pedestrian timing that is overlaid there. It is not exclusive. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. So, so... It, it, we're talking, uh, I, there is such a thing as an exclusive pedestrian phase. There's one in Morristown, uh, for example, at, at the intersection of Bank Street and, and Washington Street, where uh, everything stops, pedestrians can go, and then the traffic starts moving again. But that is not, that is not standard. Generally, it's just the timing, not the phasing, all nice. right? So let's say you had an east-west street and a north-south street, and you were trying to cross... Uh, the major, which is the north-south street. Are we together? Yes. Yep. Okay. When, when you, if you don't push that button and there is only one car going east-west, then you're going to get short cycled there. You're going to get mm -hmm. a short phase, very short phase. If you push the button, you'll get a longer phase, but you will, it's not exclusive pedestrians. Other ve vehicles are moving through there. Yes. Now, I know New Milford pretty well. I grew up in Warwick. Um, so, you know, I, and I go up there pretty frequently. If you want to meet me there, I'll take a look at it with you. Thank you. I'm actually in New Milford. We, we get confused with West Milford. I'm just east of Paramus, near Teaneck and Paramus, New Jersey, really? up in that corner. Yeah. I, I know where you are. Um, yeah. 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 I, th I thought, I thought you were talking about West Milford. But the, yes, uh, thank you. Um, you know, we can talk, call me, call me up or write me and we'll see what we can do. Okay. Can look at it with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. But just know that there is, that we're not talking about exclusive pedestrian phase. I understand we're now. Yes. About. Okay. When you, get the, when you get the light, everything's still moving. It's just, mm -hmm. the, it's not, you're not going to get short cycled there. That's the only thing that you're buying. Okay. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of information to process. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? I'll give everybody a couple of seconds because it, it's a lot. Let's hear from New Zealand. How's it? What's it like crossing the streets in New Zealand? Do you have to walk upside down and backwards, Bonnie, or what? You're on the other end of that. Oh, hi, Lucas and everybody. Great. Hello. Hi. Are you upside Great. down? Am I what? Upside down? Yes, I'm upside down. Yes. <laughs> We're on the other side of the world. So it's actually starting into fall here. So it's a bit chilly while well, you guys are going into spring. Right. But, you, have, um, you have a lot of APSs down there? We, ha we do. We have a lot of APSs, which it was it was really interesting when I came back to the States three years ago to get a clips is um, because I had gotten so used to using the audible signals that using, you know, it, it really, when I had to not use the audible signals, it was very interesting because uh, my skills I felt had gotten a bit rusty. Right. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. Different, different game down there. They're everywhere down there. It's They're everywhere. And talking about the sounds with them, sometimes it can get a bit overwhelming if you have several streets. Yeah. Finding yeah. the, uh, okay, which, which pole do I go to? Because there are four here. So which one am I listening for with all the locator beacons trying to, to uh, hone in on them? Yep. Yeah, I understand. It's uh, but it's it's a different different game here in the states. Sure yeah, totally different. And the cars are a little more respectful here, 
um, than in the States, at least in Wellington and maybe different in Auckland, which is a bigger city, but they, I don't get the, the amount of traffic checks that I would in Boston or, or New Jersey. No, no Boston girl. But how's, uh, how about the roundabouts down there? We do have roundabouts. I have actually not encountered one to cross at, thankfully. Um, so, but you're explaining them made me understand them a whole lot better than what I did before. Right. So we have to go look for one now. <laughs> That's okay. Don't rush out. <laughs> Don't rush out. Yeah, really. <laughs> thank you, Bonnie. Uh, thank you, guys. It's been great. Any other questions? Uh, Ashley, you have another question? Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, is this... Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm on. Okay, great. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, so um, you have explained that um, e when we push these buttons at the cycles for these complex intersections, that it's not necessarily a just for pedestrians, it's not an exclusive pedestrian phase. That's interesting. So I guess my big question is like, is there any apps out there or any technology being worked on to level the playing field more? Because I guess my concern is, you know, you have right cars turning and, and stuff. So we don't always know when when they're what they're going to do in us uh, moreover we don't always know as pedestrians how much time is left if we can't see the um countdown timer so is there anything being worked on in that regard other than simply a signal to tell you audible signal telling you cross the street because that's no, pretty much the across the street they, they never audible signals and will never <laughs> ever ever tell you to cross the street what they oh. will say with the what the the, the walk into the rapid tick indication or if it says a speech message yeah. the speech message simply says the street name let's say main main and that the walk, walk signal is on the walk is never on tells, it never tells you it's safe it never tells you cross now exactly. and that's very specifically done, designed that way on purpose okay yeah. Oh yeah, that's what I meant when I said it's the the audible sing, speaker says cross street. I meant to say that the mm -hmm. walk signal is lighted. That that's right. pretty much dating. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's a great. So in, in, yeah. in, ter mm -hmm. in terms of you know other ways to equalize it, you know, there's always a lot of talk going on, but but it, it, the, we're, we are part of this huge fabric, you know, of, of, of what uh -huh. traffic engineers have, have designed. And it's, it's a tall order. The other thing about this stuff is that change in traffic engineering infrastructure is generational in nature. There's a lot mm -hmm. of intersections, a lot of money involved, and it doesn't happen quick. Right, right. I, and I'm wondering too, if, um, if um, there's any, any intersections, I mean, not in my inner, and I live over toward Northern Virginia, by the way, but anyway, is there any intersections or designs out there that will um, kind of have like raised crosswalks or anything like that, that tactically, tactically guide you as well? Because that's another thing that, in my opinion, would kind of level the, the playing field so you don't like veer out of the crosswalk. Um, There's a lot of work going on in, in that regard, including some stuff uh, that uses audible beaconing. Uh, so, uh, and, and there's, uh, for example, one feature that is built into some devices is that if you hold the button down for an additional second, you would, you would get uh, the locator tone becomes louder. And what that means is, is that when you go into the street after the walk interval, while you're in the, the main course, you would be able to hear the locator tone on the other side of the street a little bit louder to give you an auditory target to move towards. Yeah. Um, and there's other technology along those lines. So yeah, this is there. There is stuff to try to address that, as well as some work that's been done that I'm I'm, I'm aware of using um, tactile lines at the down curb to line you up well for the intended crossing. Yeah, that's, that's what I about. want. Tactile lines. Well, it's being worked on. There's I'm, there's some research going on on that right now. Okay, cool. Thanks. 
Yep. Thanks, Ashley. Christina, another question? No, I don't have a question. So I just have two comments. The first is that always listen to your traffic. Know your know your traffic cycles because you really need to even, especially when you have the right on reds and cars turning in front of you. And Lucas, that's what I do with the audible with that intersection at my house is that when I hear it, I always keep telling her straight because I know which way it's like a good to line up with the other, you know, crosswalk. Yeah, I think that's a good good idea. And I, I think if, if I had to say one last thing, it would be, you know, it, it, when you get an audible indication to go, whether it be a rapid tick or uh, a message saying uh, Main Street walk sign is on to cross Main, never go. Never go. It, that's, it can be a reflexive thing. You know, there it is. Bang. Jump. Don't do that. Be, you ever heard of red light runners? They're real. Okay. Mm. So, you know, if you, so you can have somebody just late for work running that light, you know, or on the way to the hospital to, to have a baby, who the heck knows. And uh, uh, so when it goes off, it's your time to focus your listening, not your time to go focus your listening. I got it. I'm going. That's it. That's another good point. Any Thanks other questions? Well, no other questions for Lucas. Lucas, do you have anything else that you want to cover? Are we? Uh... Um, uh, no, I think we're good. Good. You covered a lot of information. Um, mm. uh, everyone, thank you for joining us. Most specifically, Lucas, it was wonderful presentation filled with a lot of information. So please know that this is recorded. It was recorded now at this point. And um, as you might all want to do is to listen to it again. So you can find it on our YouTube channel. And then also to join the Vision, the VLANJ Facebook page for Tech Talks. And this way you'll get some more information. Um, wonderful presentation, Lucas. And I really thank you all very much for joining us. A lot of information here tonight. So. Um, and of course, there, I, I have to just reflect one story quickly because when we did downtown Denville, I think I learned more standing with Lucas at that one traffic light, listening to phases, traffic phases. It was amazing and interesting. And I never, being a sighted person and being a driver, I learned more that day than I ever have before. So... He has a lot of great information to share with people. Thank you um, again, Lucas. My pleasure, Linda. I'm, glad, I'm, I, I'm always useful as a bad example, if nothing else. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah, an amazing that. guy. You are very informative. I learned a, 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 a lot of uh, new terms today. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Thank Very you. nice. Nice to have everyone with us. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you next month for another Tech Talks. And uh, stay well, everyone. Take care now. Have, have a good evening. Thank, Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Thanks, Lucas. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night, guys. Bye.